Well, as we uh, ended up last week, let me catch you up on where we were last week. Paul has began his second missionary journey. In fact, we're going to end his second missionary journey in today's lesson. He uh, is, in, is in Antioch, and it is time for him to go out. But a problem arises. Down from Judea, down in that providence of Judea, there are some Jews who have come up to Antioch, and they are in opposition to Paul. Paul has taken the gospel to the Gentiles, and Peter has taken the gospel to the Gentiles, <clears throat> and these Judaizers, who by the way, the church in Antioch has taken an offering and sitting down there during the time of the famine so they could survive, these same Judaizers come up to Antioch and say, look, uh, uh, those people that you have just talked to and just led to Christ on your first missionary journey, they need to become fully Jewish first. They need to do all the Jewish stuff that has to happen in order for them to be saved. Now, a Judaizer, just let's get the definition here, is a person who was a Jew of Jewish birth. That means he was born a Jew and his faith was a Jew. He came to be a Christian. He accepted Christ as his Savior. But then... In the midst of living out in the church, he wants to do everything like they used to do in the Jewish faith. So he wants to bring in all those regulations into the Jewish faith, into the Christian church. And there's a whole bunch of them. There was what we called last week about putting the Christian back into the Jude Jewish box. <clears throat> Well, you've got to be circumcised. You've got to do this. You've got, to, you've got to do this ceremony and this sacrifice. They're trying to put it back in the box. Well, in Antioch, they can't make a decision. So they decide, let's send Paul and these men on back down to Jerusalem. And they're in Jerusalem. Let's let them make a decision. That starts a precedent, folks. The precedent is this. They send them down there, and they have this council of Jerusalem. That sets the precedent that later on, when they have some more major problems in the church, they're going to say, we've got to have a church that can answer the questions for us. In 325 A.D., they make the decision, well, let's choose our strongest church of all the 600 and something something churches that are out there that have come to this council of Nicaea. Let's choose our strongest church, and whoever is pastor at that church will speak for the rest of the churches, and whatever he says is the voice of God. Now you know what church that ended up being. That ended up being the, the Christian church that was formed in Aquila and Priscilla's home that had grown in the city of Rome, and so it becomes the Roman church that is there, and whoever becomes the pastor of that church speaks for all the rest of the churches, and 325 they say, you got a problem, send the problem a question to, to Rome, and that church will answer it, and it's just as good as the voice of God. Well, on the next council that happens a hundred years later, uh, they change the name of that pastor, that church, from being a bishop. We didn't call them pastors back then, they were called bishops. To They gave him the name of the name Pope, and his name is Leo, and in fact, they usher a new decree that says, whatever Leo says, anathema to anybody else's decision, or any, what anybody else says, Leo is the voice of God. And so the Pope becomes the voice of God. That precedent actually starts in Antioch with them wanting somebody else to give an answer because the church in Antioch could not make a decision. You notice, remember, they go down to Jerusalem, 300 miles south of Antioch, by the way. They get down to Jerusalem... They allow all the Judaizers to speak and to have their peace. They do all the talking they have to do. And then finally, uh, uh, Peter gets up and speaks. Paul speaks. Then um, the rest of the people speak. And finally, James, the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, gets up and speak, speaks. And he makes the decision. It is not a voted on decision. James makes the decision that they're going to ask the Gentiles to do four things. They don't have to be fully Jewish, but because there are four things that are so offensive to Jews that <clears throat> these four things Gentiles need to do. Gentiles need to stay away from anything that's been sacrificed to idols. They need to stay away from anything that has been strangled. They should not eat anything that's been strangled. They should not eat anything that has been cooked in its own blood. In other words, the animal has not been bled and the blood is still there and they let, allow that blood just to cook into it. 
And the fourth thing is, is they should abstain from fornication. I have to remember, the whole world doesn't, at this point in time, except for Judaism, does not have a sanctity of the institution of marriage. <laughs> kind of like today, where we are. Uh, there, and so, the, yes, the people were married, but lots of uh, sexual relationships were going on in the Gentile world outside of marriage. So James says, when you come into the church, these are the four things you stay away from. Don't eat things offered to idols. Don't eat things that have been strangled. Don't eat things that have been cooked in their own blood. And, don't, and stay away and stay from sexual immorality or fornication. James gives the order to Paul and to Silas to take the message back to Antioch and to Syria and to Cilicia. And so that is the task for Paul and Silas. Well, they get back to Antioch and they give the message to the church there. And Paul says, hey, it's time to go on my second missionary journey. Let's go back to where we've been and check on the churches that we visited on the first journey and go elsewhere. He says to Barnabas, are you ready to go? And Barnabas says, yeah, I'm ready to go. Uh, let's take John Mark with us. Paul says, oh, no, no, no. Remember John Mark? Six years ago, he deserted us in Perga, and we do not want him with us. I don't want him with us. And there was such an eruption of dissent between Paul and Barnabas. The Paul and Barnabas separated ways. Barnabas takes John Mark, and they head to Cyprus. By the way, that's the first place they, were, they went on their missionary journey. So Barnabas takes the message of James with John Mark and heads to Cyprus, the island. Paul selects Silas as his partner. And they head off first to the east, up through Syria, back through Cilicia, which is where the message was supposed to go. And they head over to Derby, straight across on land. Well, if you remember, Derby was the end of the line on the first missionary journey. It was the last town they visited before they turned around and revisited every town and returned back to Antioch. So they head over to Derby. They've got the message. Silas is delivering one message. Paul is delivering the other message. And then they head to Lystra. And from Lystra they go to Iconium. And from Iconium they're going to head through Asia. But as they go through Asia, the Lord does not allow them to minister in Asia. He doesn't allow them to go to the east. They go right over to Troas. Now Troas is on the edge of Asia. And to get there they have to split Asia right down the middle. But they don't do any ministry in Asia. They don't start any churches. Well, we'll find out in just a little bit. The question was why. We're going to find out a little bit. Now in Troas, they, have, they go to a synagogue. They spend the night there. And in the night, Paul has a vision. He sees a man in Macedonia who is calling Paul to come over and minister to them. Next morning they get up. Paul hops on a boat. They, they float across the water 150 miles. They land and they go into Philippi, the city of Philippi. There in the city of Philippi, if you remember, they um, go to the synagogues and lo and behold, the synagogue, the, the people who are going to come to Christ, come to Christ, and then the Jews who are not going to come to Christ start doing the normal thing people do when they're mad at somebody. They start lying about them. So they go out into the city streets and they go out into the marketplace and they begin lying about Paul and his team and say, these people are teaching things that are contrary to the laws of Caesar. Now the law of Claudius, Caesar, they're talking about, actually was not even a, a, a Roman law for the matter of fact. It was a law that was developed back in the 500 B.C.s and re-quoted uh, again in the 200 B.C.s, established again, that said when there's a Caesar, no one can speak about anybody else being a king or a Caesar in the uh, area where the Caesar is in control. And because Paul is there preaching that Jesus is the king, even though he's talking about the heavenly king and the eternal king, he's not talking about an earthly king, they use that as an accusation against him to get him put in jail. And it works. They throw him in jail. They beat him. They beat him to the pulp and throw him in jail. Well, they're in there, and it's Paul and Silas and Timothy, and there's also another person in there who we don't really catch who it is until he says that we were in the jail there in Philippi just singing and praising God and worshiping. We, 
That means that Luke was there too because Luke is the author of this book that we call Acts. He's there with them. He's the constant silent companion of, of Paul every place he goes. They're praying. Lo and behold, this earthquake happens at midnight. The, the chains fall off of them. The jailer comes running and thinks that his prisoners have gone away because they're down deep. I mean deep in the dungeons where that you have to have uh, lights, uh, um, torches to go look and see. They're singing and praying down in the dark. And they hear the jailer worried about to kill himself. And Paul cries out, don't, jailer, jailer, don't do that. We're here. We're, we haven't run away. We're, we're all here. You're safe. The jailer is so thrilled. He, he comes to Paul with the, 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 the torches and he says, what must I do to be saved? Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, both you and your family. The text tells us that the jailer took him and all the people that were in the jail with him, that were under his, his guard, to his own home. And they talked and told the story of Jesus Christ and not only the jailer, but also his entire family came to know the Lord as Savior. The next, they went out, by the way, that very night and were baptized that very night. The next, yes sir, why what? Because he knew what they were teaching as a centurion and as a jailer. He knew, the question is, is why, why did he ask that question, what must I do to be saved? Because he knew what they were teaching and what they were in jail for. And this was a miracle. And in fact, it was common practice for the jailers, if they lost their prisoners, to be executed. It was far better for a jailer to commit suicide because suicide was a um, well-respected act where being executed for losing prisoners was a uh, blot on your family's name. They had not run, so they had saved him, so he wanted to know what he needed to do to have the salvation. It was the same salvation that they were preaching to everyone else. So the family is saved, the jailer is saved, and uh, uh, the next morning, the magistrates send word to let the, the folks go, let those prisoners go, they're okay, let them get out of there. And Paul says, uh-uh, not going to happen. We're not going to leave. You have taken us, we are Roman citizens, you have beat us without a trial, and you have jailed us without a trial. Now, if you were in the city, you were in the Roman-controlled area empire, and you were not a Roman, they could beat you, they could crucify you, they could throw you in jail, they could kill you, with all without a trial, it didn't matter, they could just do it. But if you were a Roman citizen, there was a law that had been enacted, and you could not beat a Roman citizen, or you could not throw them in jail, or anything without them having a trial. Well, Paul and his team did not have a trial. The magistrates were found out that they were Roman citizens. They didn't even question their Roman citizenship. They were worried. You see, the town of Rhodes had crucified a Roman citizen without a trial, and Claudius Caesar, just that year, had ripped their authority from the town where they couldn't judge anybody. They could make no decision. It had to be judged by the magistrates in another town. And Philippi did not want to lose their authority from Claudius Caesar to judge people. Paul says, you come down here and you apologize to us and then we will leave. And so the magistrates do as Paul asks. They come and apologize. They let them go. Let them go. Paul and the team go to Lydia's house. They say goodbye to her. And on down um, they head down to Thessalonica. And that's where we pick up at chapter 17 verse 1. Now when they had traveled through Amphi Amphipolis and Apollyon, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Okay, a couple of things right here. <clears throat> this tells us something. Because they go through these two towns onto Thessalonica, it tells us that Paul is not going a back way down to Thessalonica. He's not running from anything. He is on the great Ignatian Way, which was the incredible road that the Romans had built that... that, that um, extended over 500 miles from way up north all the way south and it runs by the, the water there on the east side of the uh, peninsula there. It's a very beautiful drive. It runs over 500 miles. So they are out in the open for everybody to see. The first city is about, um, about 32 miles from Philippi. So it's very possible they spent the first night there. Now listen, a, 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 day, a normal day's journey was 20 miles. To go 32 miles was a stretch, but they could have made it. Yeah, maybe they, spent, they took two days to get there and spent the night. And then on to the next city was another 32 miles. 
And then from the, that second city on to Thessalonica was 86 miles. So that was a long journey. They get to Thessalonica. Thessalonica used to be called Therma. But when Alexander the Great died, um, one of his, uh, his sisters, his half-sister, his half-sister was named Thessalonica. She had married the ruler who becomes the ruler of that area. And, and her husband changes the name of Therma to Thessalonica in honor of Alexander the Great's half-sister. He gets down to Thessalonica, and when he gets there, he says he goes to a synagogue of the Jews. Now, that's interesting because in the other places, he says the synagogue of the Jews. What this is saying, and I had to go look it up because I thought, why is there a word change in here? And there really definitely is a word change. Thessalonica did not have very many Jews. And so they did not have multiple synagogues. Remember we talked about at the death of Christ, there were over a hundred synagogues in the city of Jerusalem, one for every language that the people would speak from where they came. Where if, they, if they came from the North Africa, those people who spoke those languages had a synagogue in Jerusalem for that language, even though they were Jewish proselytes. They, had come to, they weren't Jewish by birth, they were Jewish by faith. They had a synagogue for that or for the Syrians or for the Pont, ones from Pontius or the ones from Rome or the ones from Spain. They had different synagogues. There's only a synagogue, one synagogue in Thessalonica, and Thessalonica did not have very many Jews in it because they couldn't make a living there. So they had a synagogue. It is one synagogue. That is all that we know about in Thessalonica. He goes to that synagogue, verse 2, and according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures. For three weeks, we got it. Or two weeks, three Sabbaths, we've got it. It goes into three weeks. Verse 3, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I, I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas along with a great multitude of God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. So the work in Thessalonica in just three Sabbaths plus a little bit of time is incredible. A whole bunch of folks, Greek and Gentiles, turn to be part of the church there. Well, you know what happens when some, whenever, after you've already claimed all the folks that are going to be there, same thing happened at Philippi, it's going to happen in here in Thessalonica. As soon as all the people who are going to become part of the church or part of the church, all those who are not going to be part of the church begin to lie about it. So here's what happens. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace. There's the key. Wicked men. They can't just out-talk Paul, so they're going to go get some people who will lie really well. Some wicked men. Some people who are corrupt criminals. You remember when uh, Jezebel wanted that vineyard for her husband Ahab, and Naboth would not sell it. What does she do? She goes and calls this thing called a fast. And every time they have a fast in Israel, that they send out word to all the, the country because they're going to have this fast. And at this fast, the people come in from every, every roach and, and cockroach and criminal comes in because the Jews, in order that festival, are going to give their food to them and they're going to give them alms. And when you're giving food and money to somebody, you can get a lot of people to say just about anything you want them to say. And if you remember, Jezebel got those people to lie against Naboth and have him killed so she could possess the farm, and she does. And then she gives it to Ahab, and Ahab goes, Oh my, what have you done? What have you done? And of course, she dies because of that act. In fact, the prophecy comes that, uh, that she will not be buried and lo and behold, she hits the ground and the dog's eaten and only leaves the palms of her hands and the, and the feet uh, and her feet. That's all that's left of her because of the sin that's in her life. They, this, these people here in Thessalonica get all these criminals to come and they are boasting these things that are against the truth of what Paul is doing and the team is doing. Hmm. Well, here's what happens. <clears throat> Going on, it says, they got the men from the marketplace and formed a mob and set the city in an uproar and, be, and coming upon the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. And when they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren from the city of, before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have, uh, have upset the, the world have come here also. And Jason, having welcomed them, 
and they all act contrary uh, to the decree of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. It is the same accusation that was used against them in Philippi. You can't talk about another king in the, in the area controlled by Caesar. So they're using this old law and saying, hey, they've caused the whole world to be upset. And by the way, they have caused the old world, whole world to upset. Remember that, because I'm going to tell you about something in just a few minutes when we get down to, um, to Corinth about them being upset. Well, they've dragged Jason out into the streets. Jason and some of his friends who are believers and they've welcomed Paul into their homes. That's where they're staying. They're providing for them. They drag them out of the street and they beat them. And in doing so, they are, they are upset. And finally, we don't see it here, but we know it from another place. Uh, Paul and the team joins them and here's what happens. They take the team, they put them uh, under custody and verse 8 says, And they stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things. And when they had received a pledge from Jason and others... They released them. They had to post a bond. They had to put up money to keep everybody free. Now, in, in Philippi, they just threw them in jail. But here in Thessalonica, they gave them the opportunity to post a bond. You know, money will buy you just about anything. Did you realize that? Enough money can get you out of jail pretty much anytime, anywhere. You know, set a, set a bond at $6 million. If you can come up with a bond for $6 million, they'll let you go. They will. Well, I don't know what the bond was, but Jason and his friends put up enough and that got them to the point where he could allow Paul and the rest of them to be free. Now, I want you to notice something. Just because something is in the Bible does not mean it's godly. I want you to understand that. There are lots of things that happen in the Bible that are not godly. And I have trouble with what Paul does next. I do not believe it is godly. In fact, we're going to find out that I believe that it's not godly. And as we go through, Paul is going to make a series of decisions on this second journey here between Thessalonica and Corinth that are going to, it's going to cause the Lord himself to have to speak to Paul in another vision. And that happens in chapter 18. Paul is making poor decisions. Here's what happens. Verse 10. And the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. A bond has just been placed for them stating what a bond does or a pledge is that they will remain there and they will show back up when it's time for them to be judged. But no, that's not what they do. They send Paul and Silas running. Timothy stays behind in Berea. Timothy's going to end up going down to Thessalonica and then catching up with Paul in Athens, going back to Thessalonica, then coming back and catching up with Paul with Silas in Corinth. Now Silas and Paul are on the run. So they head off down to the water. I don't agree with that. I don't. The Lord can protect them. But Paul is not operating, in my mind, under the leadership of the Lord at this point in time because of the things that happened. Verse 11. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let's go back to verse 10. And the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews the synagogue of the Jews. Different wording than the other place. This means there's more than one synagogue in Berea and it did have several synagogues. They're going to the ones that's of the Jews, the ones of Jewish birth because there's also those who are, are, are of other languages too. They're going to go to the ones that have, speak Hebrew. Verse 11, Now these were more noble-minded than those of Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily, to see whether these things were so. So they're willing to listen to Paul. As Paul proclaims the scripture, they're willing to listen. They think about it, they talk about it, they examine the scripture. Next time they come back together, they talk about it again. They're noble-minded. However, you know there's always somebody that hates you enough that they'll do anything to get in your way. Did you know that? Sure you know that. Most of you all are old enough to know that. We all learn that by fifth by by the time we're a five year old, we just can't understand it then. But there's always somebody who who is out to get us. There are an ungodly person who's out to get us. So there are people who come through Thessalonica, and um, I mean they're in Berea, and and they're Jews, and they stop by the synagogue because that's the thing to do. And when they go on up the road, finally when they get to Thessalonica, they're going to stop by the synagogue, and you know what they're going to tell? They say, hey. We just met a guy. You ought to hear what they're talking about down there in, Thess in, in uh, Berea. They're talking about Christ and about the resurrected Savior. And the Thessalonians go, what? 
Where is he? We've got a bond on him. So they're headed down the fist. Here we go. I don't make this stuff up. Here we go. Verse 13. But when the Jews of Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul and Berea, also they came there likewise, agitating and stirring up the crowd. They have just gone miles and miles and miles to stir up trouble with Paul. There's always somebody, always somebody, who will go out of their way to stir up trouble. Verse 14, And then immediately the brethren sent Paul out to go as far as the sea, and Silas and Timothy remained there. They end up, we got Silas and Timothy in, um, in Berea with them. Paul, they send Paul out. You got to get out of here. So he's run from Thessalonica. He's now running from Berea. They take him out as far as the sea. That means they take him back to the nation way, the road down there. And they leave Silas and Timothy in Berea. And then there are some folks that go on with Paul down to Athens. Here it is in verse 15. Now those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens and received a command for Silas and Timothy to come as soon as possible, and they departed. Paul gets down to Athens uh, with a whole crowd of folks who are accompanying him, so he gets there safely with Paul and both Luke, by the way. Luke is there. It's just Paul and Luke. And Paul says to the people who brought him from Berea, Y'all go on back and you tell Paul and uh, Timothy and Silas to come on to me as soon as they can. And then the, the people who accompanied him headed on back up to Berea. It's just Paul and Luke there in Athens. That's where they are. Verse 16. Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was beholding the city full of idols. Paul is out walking around the city of Athens. He is going to every gold and silver and stone statue and he is reading every single inscription that is under every single statue and it's going to come for his good in just a little bit, in a few days. And he's there by himself with Luke and they are struggling and they're just roaming the city. Now, Seneca, who was the tutor of Nero, of Nero talks about Athens. He tells us that there were over, in this day and time, there were over 30,000 idols of either gold, silver, or some sort of stone in Athens. He also says that if you were in trouble, it would be easier for you to find an idol than a human to help you. Because that's how many there were. Paul is out there looking around and he's reading them all. He's spending his time and he's getting more upset. So it then comes time for... He, he's not going to wait for his team. He decides it's time for him to go speak to the Athenians. Now, Athens is a university town. So that means that things are going to be thought of a little different. In fact, they're going to be willing to talk about just about anything he wants to talk about. And you know how it is in the universities. In the universities, any new thought that comes along is going to have to be talked about. And they'll talk about it till it's absolutely a dead issue and then they'll make it a theory, which is what they call the truth. But, and it may not be the truth at all. Now, I hate to say something like that because some of y'all may work on the, in the colleges, but you really, the mindset of the colleges is so wide open that they will accept something that is not truth as truth. Same thing's going to happen in Athens. Verse 17. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those uh, who, were who, were, who happened to be present. <laughs> he just showed up to buy grapes and you got a message from Paul. He's going to tell you about Jesus Christ. He's going to reason with you. He's a constant evangelist. Think about our own little Stella Walsh. Now you may have been saved for 50 years and been in the church and done everything in the world and she's still going to ask you about your salvation. And when, you know, that's the way it is. She's going to find out whether you're really, same thing, really say That's what Paul is going to do. He's, he's going to talk to everybody who comes around. Verse 18. And also some of the Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. The heyday of Athens is over. Athens was the home of people like Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Zena, Epicurus, and many, many others. 
the heyday of the philosophy and the poets and all that's over by this day. However, it still has its reputation. In fact, at the Aragopagus, up on the hill, the court of the Aragopagus, that is the place where it's a safe place for people to go talk about any new theory, any new thought, any new religion whatsoever. It's a safe place. Now, it's not on Mars Hill as most ministers try to teach that it is. It's off to the side. It's actually a larger place. It's a place where more people can gather. Mars Hill is a smaller place than this where not as many people could gather. So it's, the, it's called the Court of the Aragopagus. In fact, we'll find that out in just a minute because of the way things are worded here. He says, in some of these folks, these Stoic philosophers were saying, what would this, what would this idler babble, idle, idle babbler wish to say? Others says things like this. He seems to be a proclaimer of a strange deity because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Aragopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming. This is not what happened in Philippi. This is not what happened in Berea. This is not what happened in Thessalonica. Hey, we got 30,000 gods. What's another god? Let's talk about it. Let's see what it is. The city of Athens is not under the same restrictions because of this philosophy and this thought and everything. They were willing to talk about anything and everything and they wanted to know about this new God that Paul is talking about. Hey, we can make us another idol. We got room. We got 30,000. We can have 30,000 in one. What's another idol? You see how open-minded they are? Okay, here we go. Verse 20 says, For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. We want to know, therefore, what these things mean. They are willing to accept any new thing because the old things aren't working, folks. And if, they, if a new thing can come along, they'll gladly accept it and, and embrace it. That's just the way it is in a college town and a university town. And so that's what they're doing. Verse 21 is not in the oldest and most reliable scriptures, so we'll skip over it. Verse 22 says, And Paul stood in the midst of the Aragopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. Remember, religious does not mean godly. Religious does not mean you have a relationship with the Lord. Religious just means you're religious about something. <clears throat> I'm noticing from just looking at you that some of y'all are religious about your pancakes and bacon. <clears throat> In fact, you're so religious about them that you overeat them <laughs> along with your steaks and everything. Yes, and yes, sir? Superstitious, yes. Well, religion and superstitious are exactly the same thing because you can be religious about something. In fact, James has already written his letter. He says, if you claim to be religious and bridle not your tongue, harden your heart, your religion is in vain or your superstition is vain or your belief system is in vain. It could be the word belief system also. Well, he says here, verse 23, For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I was good for him to go out and look around. It's going to come to... He's, he's read every one of those, script, those inscriptions. He says, I also found an altar with, the, with this inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore your, you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. Ignorance does not mean that they were silly or stupid. It means that they just didn't know who this unknown God was. And they were looking for this unknown God. They want to know who this unknown God was. So Paul is going to use that as a jumping off spot to teach them about Christ. <clears throat> Verse 24. The God who, who made the world and all things in it, since He is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all life and breath and all things. And he made from one every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitations, that they should seek God, if, perhaps, they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, and even some of your own poets have said, for we, are also, for we also are his offspring. Well, that's a long sentence, isn't it? Being then the offering of God, we ought not to think of the divine nature that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. Therefore, therefore, having overlooked the 
the, uh, uh, the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all everywhere should repent because He has fixed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom He has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising Him from the dead. Up until this point, the Athenians are with Him. He has said nothing to this point except for that last sentence that is going to throw them into a haywire situation. The Athenians believed in the afterlife. You remember the gods, Zeus and um, Poseidon and all the gods and the men who were on earth who were half gods and they believed about they believed about the afterlife, but the thing that they did not believe about was a resurrected man. That threw them for a loop. And when he said that, that caused the stir with them. Everything else he said was okay. He said to them, listen, this unknown God that you want to know about, God is proclaiming to you who that unknown God is that you need to worship. And he says, he's telling you this through me and through the proof that there was a resurrected man, Jesus Christ, raised from the dead. Verse 32. <clears throat> now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer, but others said, we shall hear you again concerning this. Just like it. They could not say anything back against Paul at this point in time. So they thought, you know, we need to go and have our Starbucks coffee. And we need to sit around and talk about this amongst ourselves. So we can come back and have some more questions for you. So we're going to draw this committee meeting to a close. And we'll reveen, uh, uh, come back together again at another date, another time. So we can talk about this some more. Because we want to know more about this. This is not what he got in Philippi or Berea or in Thessalonica. There he got thrown in jail or have to put up bond. But here, we're just going to talk about this some more. Well, that's not what happens. <clears throat> Verse 33, So Paul went out of their midst, but some of the men joined him and believed. Among them were Dionysus the Aragopagat and a woman named Demarius and others with them. Well, Paul has made some inroads into the Athenian system. <clears throat> Dionysus, the Apagopiac, is one of the twelve judges. Now, the twelve judges in the court of their Aragopagus were the twelve judges that made Athens famous. That's that court that sits up on this hill where all the philosophy was discussed. It was a safe place. You could say anything you wanted and somebody would rebut against you as a place of debate, but it was a very polite place. So all through the days of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and all the rest of them, those days was all, were all gone. But the people who made Athens great and allowed them to be who they were, were this, was this 12-member court of the Aragopagus. And Dionysus was one of those 12 in that day. Now he had taken other people, another person's place. He was not one of the ones that made it famous, but the court was the one that made Athens famous. So he is sitting in a very revered spot as a, as a judge to decide whether this is something we should embrace or not embrace. It really wasn't a court battle type thing because it was about the thoughts that were going on. He accepts the Lord and becomes a Christian. Now not many of us in America have, will lose our job because we become a Christian. Now in other parts of the world that happens. And then for him, when he became a Christian, he lost his job on the court. In fact, he's in the Book of Martyrs because he becomes the pastor of the church in Athens and later gives his life for Christ. That's how important he is to the ministry. Well, verse, chapter 18, verse 1. And after these things, he left Athens and he went to Corinth. He didn't give them another chance, folks, to talk. He didn't give them another opportunity to discuss it again. He had said all he, was going to, all he was going to say. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontius, having re recently uh, come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded that all the Jews to, commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. So he came to them. Okay, Paul ends up in Corinth with Luke, and they have no money whatsoever. 
They don't have any way to buy food or provide a place for shelter. They have nobody to bring them into their home. And so they go down to the area where the tent makers are because he, as a Benjamite, was a tent maker. Even though he became a Pharisee, he is a tent maker by trade. He goes down there and he meets Aquila and Priscilla and they are already believers. In fact, they have already started a church in Rome. They lived in Rome. Aquila was from Pontius, from Pontius. If you go back and look in Acts chapter 2, verse 9, it said there were, believer, there were Jewish people there in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost from Pontius. Well, Aquila and Priscilla had to find out about Christ somewhere, and so it's very likely they were in uh, Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost and then took the faith of Christ back to Pontius and then moved on over to Rome, into the city of Rome. There they had started a church. In the last part of 49 A.D., Claudius Caesar has had it with all Jews of, of, of Jewish uh, descent in the city of Rome and in fact in the city of Italy. And he makes a decree in the last part of D A.D. 49, first part of A.D. 50, that all the Jews are to get out of Rome and in fact to get out of Italy. The reason why is because the Jews are bickering and fighting about a, the, about a man who has instigated a conflict between Jews by the name of Crestus. He called, uh, actually, he calls, calls it Crestus. He mispronounced it. He mispronounced it. He, and, and that we spell it like this, C-H-R-E-S-T-U-S. -E He's talking about Christ. You see, the Jews in Rome, there are the believers there who are Jews and there are Jewish folks who are not believers. And they are, this tumult is going on. And Claudius has had it. He says, I want every Jew, I don't care whether you're a Christian or, or just a regular Jew. He doesn't know even to say that, but that's what he means. Get out of Rome. So Aquila and Priscilla leave Rome and go over and make a home in Corinth and they have already begun a church in their home in Corinth. They started one in Rome they start one in Corinth, and lo and behold, they're fixing to go start one in Ephesus, not long for here. Paul meets Aquila and Priscilla, and they begin, uh, he begins tent making to um, provide him with income while he's there in Corinth. So, verse 17, So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, and in the marketplace, every, um, every, I'm back up, where am I? Verse 6. Verse 6. 18, nope, I want verse 4. Sorry, I backed up the wrong place. And when he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks, but when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. As long as Paul and, Timoth and, Paul and Luke are just going on the Sabbath, things are going rolling along pretty well. Because during the week, he's out there doing tent making, so he's not bothering anybody. But Silas and Timothy show up. Now Luke doesn't tell us what happens here, but Paul does. Paul writes to the, the church, write, will write back to the church in Corinth. He will also write to the Thessalonian church, and he will also write to the Philippian church, because what he will and he talks to us in those three books about the offering that Timothy and Silas bring from Macedonia to Corinth so that he can stop being a tent maker and go into the livelihood of every day preaching the gospel. So when Silas and Timothy show up, they're bringing money. So he can stop being a tent maker. And he teaches every day. And that doesn't do anything but cause problems in Corinth. The Jews don't like him talking about the resurrected Christ every single day. Verse 6. And when they resisted and blasphemed, blasphemed. In other words, what that means is they're lying about Paul. They are lying. Everything, whenever somebody gets tired of you, the first thing that happens is they're going to start lying. They're, that's what happens. It happens in family relationships. It happens. They start getting personal and start making up lies. And it doesn't matter whether it's truth or not because it's all based on what their perception was. And you can't ever change somebody's perception. And their perception of the Jews is that Paul is lying. So they call him that. They tell him he's lying. And so they said to him, so Paul resisted the, and they blasphemed. So Paul shook out his garment and said to them, you, your blood is on your own heads, hands. Heads, I'm sorry. I am clean. From now on, I shall go to the Gentiles. So Paul takes his garment, and he flips it out, and he says, which is a, way, a Hebrewism that they did, and said, 
Blood's on your hands. I'm tired of you. From now on, I'm only going to the Gentiles. I'm not going to deal with any more Jews whatsoever. The converts who are converts, I'll deal with them, but I'm not going to deal with any more Jews. I'm going to the Gentiles. And so what does he do? He uh, departs out of, the, out of the synagogue right there, and he goes right to a Jewish house. Mm -hmm. That's what happens. And he departed from there, verse 7, he went to the house of a certain man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God, whose house was next to the synagogue. He's a Jew. Actually, his father is a Gentile, and his mother is a Jew, and they worship as a Jew, but he's a convert. And his house actually has a common wall with the synagogue. I mean, it's not like a wall here and a wall here. No, inside of his house, one of his walls on the other side is the synagogue. He's a Jew. He goes there, look here. And Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, follows him, believed in the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, when they, when they heard, were, bat, being, were, were believing and being baptized. The efforts of Paul are working. And Crispus, Crispus, who is the leader of the synagogue, becomes a Christian and loses his job as the leader of the synagogue. And he goes over with Paul. And they're having their pity party. Well, Paul's so mad, he's not going to go to the Jews anymore. Verse 9. The Lord's going to correct him. And the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you. And no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in the city. Now, he doesn't say he has believers. He's just got people. He's got people who are going to protect him, Christian or not, Jewish or not. They're going to protect Paul. They're just going to protect him. The Lord has people that protect him. So the Lord had to speak audibly. If that's not in red in your Bible, get you a red marker and make it red because that's the words of the Lord speaking to him. He shouldn't have run. He's running. He's running for his life. He's making up things he shouldn't do. He is out of God's will in the past even though God's working with him to bring people to Christ. By the way, you can be all the way out of God's will. In fact, you can be a lost preacher. You know that? You cannot have a relationship with Christ and still God can use you to bring people to Christ because we've seen it before. And then the people get saved. <laughs> Thank you for that. Verse 11. And he settled there for a year and six months. Eighteen months he's there. He's teaching the word of God, and, uh, uh, God among them. Stop right here between verses 11 and 12. Uh, no, let's, let's go on, then I'll stop in a minute. But while Ga Gallio was proconsul of Acacia, by the way, a long time ago, we found a lot limestone uh, monument in Corinth that has Gallio's name. And the year that uh, Claudius Caesar put Gallio in as proconsul, and it was 51 A.D., uh, Gallio's uh, brother was Seneca, who was the tutor of Nero. He had another brother also. The great Gallio family in Rome that were potters, uh, they made pottery, uh, very good, expensive pottery with all the designs on it, the Roman designs, and you know, about the Roman pottery, the Venetian. Well, uh, they adopted the three boys. And Galileo was such a wonderful, distinct, a, a reverent, um, uh, just a good guy. In fact, his brother Seneca says, of all the men that I've ever met in the world, no one of them has ever been as nice to a single man as Galileo is to all mankind. Uh, he was refined. He was very cultured. And so Claudius takes Gallio and he puts him down in Corinth. But Gallio doesn't know any of the laws. He's just a great guy, okay? He's just a great ambassador. He puts him down in that area. Uh, he's adopted. He's taken on the Spanish name. We actually know his other name, but that's in the footnotes that I don't have for you today. But we'll get them to you next week uh, when I give you a whole copy of even this lesson next week. And, 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 he, and we know who he is, and he is there, and he's brand new on the job. <laughs> and here's what happens. But while Gallio was proconsul of Acacia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him before the judgment seat, saying, This man persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, they bring the same accusation that the Philippians, the Bereans, the Thessalonians all bring against Paul, but Gallio doesn't know the law. He doesn't know that he's talking about they're proclaiming another king besides Caesar. He doesn't know that. So Paul, that he listens to what they have to say, to the Jews what they have to say, and Paul's about ready to speak and he starts to open his mouth and Gallio does not even allow Paul to speak for him. Gallio speaks for Paul. He goes on and says, um, 
If it were a matter of wrong or a vicious crime, O oh Jews, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you. But if there are questions about words and names in your own law, look after it yourself. I am unwilling to be a judge of these matters. And he drove them away from the judgment seat. <laughs> he said, I'm not dealing with Paul with this. It's fine. If you want to deal with it, you deal with it, whatever. But you're not going to harm this man. Get on out of here. Get on out of here. The Jews are so upset with the new leader of the synagogue. You know, Crispus has become a, 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 a believer, so he's no longer got his job. The guy who takes his place is named Sosthenes. The Jews have been, have been relying on Sosthenes as their leader to evoke the correct, what they expect to be the right uh, um, verdict out of Gallio, and he fails. And here's what happens to Sosthenes. And they all took hold of Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and began beating him in front of the judgment seat. We ought to do that to some of our leaders, should we? Yeah. yeah. And Gallio was not concerned about any of these things. He just let them beat him. By the way, the beating for Sosthenes was for his own good. We don't know it here because Luke does not tell us here, but Sosthenes is so upset with his own people that he decides, maybe I better look into Christ, the Savior. And he becomes a convert. Loses his job in the synagogue, but by, first, by the time Paul writes back to 1 Corinthians, Paul tells in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, about Sosthenes, his faithful fellow worker in the faith. You got it? So that beating was for the good of Sosthenes. Yeah, you get beat by your own people, you're just like a dog. You'll go run someplace else, won't you? That's the same thing that happened with Sosthenes, and he went over to the truth. Verse 18. Now, let's stop at verse 17. Here's why I need to stop. <clears throat> Between verse 17 and verse 18, <clears throat> Timothy has come. He's, he's already come to Athens and brought word, and Paul has sent Timothy back to Thessalonica. Now, here in Corinth, Silas and Timothy has showed up. The report of what has happened in Thessalonica is for the most part good, but there are some strange errors and misunderstandings of what Paul taught there and what Silas and Timothy taught there in Thessalonica that Paul has to write them a letter. And he sends it back to Thessalonica with Timothy. We call it 1 Thessalonians. Timothy delivers the letter. The people are excited about it. They embrace it. In fact, they over-embrace it. And they begin teaching something that is wrong again. Timothy comes back to Corinth. Back in Corinth, he reports to Paul. Paul goes, whoa, 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 wait a minute. They're taking that wrong. I need to send another letter. So he writes 2 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians is written at the end or about the middle of 51 to 50, beginning of 52 AD. And then 2 Thessalonians is written within about six months of that. The second letter is, is, is sent back because the Thessalonians are teaching that the day of Christ is here. It is right upon us. So Paul writes back and says, no, 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 you misunderstood. The day of Christ, or the day of the Lord, as we would call it other places, will not happen until two things happen, two of four things. He actually mentions four things. Two things have to happen. One Number one is the great apostasy must come into the world. He doesn't say it happens in the church. He just calls it the great apostasy. Now, I think I know what that apostasy is. There's no greater apostasy in the world today than Islam. And I believe is the, Islam is the apostasy because I believe the, apost the apostasy, which is the uh, adulterous woman in the book of Acts, is Islam. Number two, he says, the second thing that must happen is, is the man of lawlessness must arrive. Now, John is going to call him in one of his letters, the Antichrist, and in the Revelation, he's going to call him the beast. The other two things are this. Within the church, the sanctity of marriage must become something that is not important. Eh, you're living together, you're not married, it's okay. We're there. The second thing is, the other thing that he talks about is, the idea of fasting will become rampant of not eating meats and not eating foods, uh, that you need to go for a long period of time without foods. That's the four things that Paul writes back to them. And that's going to happen in the church. Two of the things happen in the world and two of the things happen in the church. 
We're there. We're there. It's just around the corner. So Paul writes 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians between verse 17 and 18. That's where it goes. Verse 18. And Paul, having remained there many days longer, took leave of the brethren and took out to, oh, put out to sea for Syria. And when he and Priscilla and Aquila, uh, with, uh, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, in Chinchira, he had his hair cut, for he was keeping a vow. Okay. They have to leave Corinth and they go over to this little port area. You pick up non-commercial uh, boats, uh, boats that would just go across the 150 miles over to, uh, to Asia, back to Asia where the Lord would not allow him to minister before. They're going to go over to Ephesus. In Chinchira, uh, Paul cuts his hair because of a vow. Mm, now let's back up. <clears throat> Some people teach that this is a Nazarite vow, but it cannot be a Nazarite vow because a Nazarite vow has to be ended at the temple door in Jerusalem. It is there in the temple door where you cut the hair and you offer it on the brazen altar uh, there inside the, in, inside the temple and then there's instructions of some things you do. So this cannot be a Nazarite vow because he's not in Jerusalem. He's going to make it to Jerusalem. He could have waited until then. There's some other ceremonial things that evidently Paul's hair had grown to a certain length that Jewish people would be offended by it when he got back to Jewish type country. Okay? So he cuts it. Whatever the vow is that Paul is keeping, he probably did not shave his head bald. He probably just had it trimmed or cut to make, get it back to a proper level. Now, we did not, you did not ever see Jewish men with hair down to here. It was always over the shoulder, but it was not down to here. And they always had their beards and all that. That's all fine and dandy underneath their prayer shawls and all that thing they wear. But it could not be very long. He had to get it back. Why? Because Paul kept all the ceremonial law of being a Jew, even though he never inflicted that and caused a Gentile to have to keep the same law. Well, here's what happens, and we can end here pretty quick. They finally get on the boat. Verse 19, they came to Ephesus, and he left them there. <laughs> Aquila and Priscilla, he leaves in Ephesus, and they're going to start a church there. He hops on a boat. That's what he does. Now, he himself even entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. So he does that. They help start a church. Verse 20, And when they asked him to stay for a longer time, he did not consent, but, leave, but taking leave of them and saying, I will return to you again if God wills, he set sail from Ephesus. And when he had landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and went down to Antioch. Actually, he went up in our mind to Antioch. He goes and he hops on this boat. He gets to Caesarea. He goes to the synagogue and to the church. He greets the people of the church. And then he goes 275 miles north to Antioch. And there he's going to pull out his Starbucks coffee and his slides. And he's going to show them to everybody just like a regular missionary, right? No, he didn't have Starbucks and he didn't have slides. But he tells them all about his missionary journey. His second journey is over. It is done. He has traveled over 2,455 miles in just a little over three and a half years. His first journey took almost six years, but his second journey is about three and a half years. And he's come back and great strides have been made for the Lord. But he's learned some lessons. He's learned that he does not have to fear when people are fearful against him because the Lord is on his side. And he will not make those mistakes again. Lord, we just thank you for your message that you've delivered to us through the hands of Luke. Teaching us how you think and what you, how we are to witness. And we are to witness without fear to everyone who perhaps comes and passes by our presence. May we be bold and have that in our lives. That we find out if everyone, if they belong to you. Lord, may we be just as great in evangelizing as Paul was. It's a struggle for most of us, but may you give us that boldness that we need. Lord, thank you for all that you've done for us and the way you've loved us. In your son's name, amen.